Hello, everyone who is uh, here this uh, glorious Saturday. It's, uh, it is absolutely beautiful outside today. Um, so thank you all for being here on uh, Saturday, April 18th. Um, so we're happy to have everyone here. And, uh, and I hope that everyone is safe and healthy in wherever everyone has found themselves. Um, we are still Atlanta Contemporary, still temporarily closed as are um, all institutions right now. Um, so as we navigate this new normal, we're looking forward to navigating a new new, um, whatever, whatever that looks like. We'll be sharing with everyone kind of what our future holds in terms of exhibitions and programs. Uh, for now, we're maintaining our virtual programming and uh, we're happy to once again be partnering with two of our favorite people, uh, Joey and Chris of Discrit. So we're looking forward to a very uh, robust discussion on trend forecasting led by uh, Chris. Um, I know that Joey's gonna also be fielding some questions in the chat. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to put that in there. So we're gonna have uh, Chris doing his lecture and then uh, we'll open that up for a workshop kind of forum that Chris and Joey are going to lead. Um, I also wanna say thank you obviously to everyone who supports us, all of our members and donors who generously underwrite our mission and vision to change the way we all see art. Um, you know, as, as we continue this, uh, shelter in place quarantine um we we graciously appreciate any and all gifts um from our donors and our and our sponsors and our members um we couldn't do this without you even even virtually um we're continuing to compensate and pay all of our vendors and contractors and partners that we we work with and we're commissioning even new work so thank you to everyone um this is being recorded and so we will be sharing it afterwards as well. So I'm gonna try and do this correctly and do the speaker view and all that so it, it looks right. But uh, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce uh, Discrit and then Joey, I believe is gonna introduce uh, Chris. So Discrit or Critical Discourse is an initiative of public knowledge sharing and discussion, spanning lectures, seminar style discussions, critiques and screenings, even virtually. Discrit provides the public with programming dedicated to explorations of contemporary art and culture and free university quality art education. Discrit is Joey Molina and Chris Bernald. So uh, take it away, Joey. Thanks, Veronica. Hi, everyone. I'm Joey. Um, yeah, I just want to let you guys in real quick on a couple of things. I went ahead and added a trend forecast key term sheet on the chat, which you can open. Um, it just has a rundown of some of the stuff that Chris will be going through. Um, and yeah, so they'll be using the Trend Forecasters Handbook as um, a guide to take participants behind the curtain of one of contemporary culture's most mysterious, misunderstood, and maligned professions, trend forecasting. Um, and I won't say too much beyond that because we're gonna hear it soon. Um, but I do wanna shout out um, Idea Capital who have been supporting a lot of our programming this year and will continue to into the rest of the year, wherever that takes us, if we continue to do online stuff or yeah. physical events, which we miss doing, because that was a lot, a big part of what we do. But yeah, without further ado. Yeah, like Joey said, um, we're gonna be uh, talking about trends today. Um, we're going to base this around um, this book that the contemporary is selling. Um, it's Trend Forecaster Martin Raymond's um, The Trend Forecaster's Handbook 2020 edition. Um, and we're going to be using it to uh, begin to answer a couple of really big questions. Um, one, how do new forms of culture, politics, technology, art, design, ideas, morality, and more take place or take shape and spread throughout our culture. 
Um, how do we learn to notice, define, and anticipate these nascent movements and motions? And how can we learn to forecast the shape our future will take? But before we dive into all the big questions, I'll start by giving you guys, again, a, a little bit more of a detailed roadmap of where we're going to be going today. Um, we're going to first start with the basics, which depending on your background, you may have learned in um, like marketing 101 in school or in your workplace. Um, we're going to define what a trend is. Um, and then we'll discuss something called the diffusion of innovations curve, which shows us how new ideas travel through our society and the path they take towards acceptance or dismissal. In the next part of the lecture, I'll take you through what Raymond calls the trend forecasters toolkit, which is an array of methodologies he and other trend forecasters employ to scan the world around us, gather data, make hypotheses, and then challenge and test those hypotheses before formulating supportable predictions about the future of our tastes, needs, wants, and behaviors. So after we've learned a bit about the field of forecasting and the behavior of ideas in our culture and the tools that forecasters employ to make predictions and recommendations, um, we will open up into our workshop. And in the workshop, we're all gonna reflect on some of the raw data that all of us have been exposed to just you know, over the past year, couple of months, weeks, days, hours, minutes, whatever. Um, and we'll kind of do a great uh, a group brainstorm um, across a couple different sectors um, where we'll make our own predictions for, um, you can say, uh, what the world will look like a year from now. Um, so let's see. And yeah, and for that part of the event, I don't want you guys to stress too much um, about being correct or having your assertion be totally supportable. You know, this is just kind of be kind of imaginative and fun. And if there's a technique that you want to use to support your idea that you hear in um, in the talk, then by all means do that. But it's not at all required. Um, all right, so I am going to uh, open my keynote, share my screen in just a minute. The new set trend forecasting. Okay, share screen, share. Hope you guys can see that. Yes. Okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> All right, so this is our Intro to Trend Forecasting Seminar and Workshop. Um, this is a quote that occurs at the beginning of the book that I thought was really great about the nature of the future. It says, um, uh, the future is in a fog shrouded landscape with a single difficult to navigate road running through it. If anything, it resembles an endless archipelago Archi I hate this word so much, archipelago of possible, plausible, that's supposed to say probable, and preferable islands of possibility, all being sculpted and shaped by those winds of change we refer to as trends. All right, so we're gonna start with the basics. What is a trend? In the simplest sense, uh, trends are the direction along which agents of change travel. They are the patterns or anomalies that emerge in everyday life that can persuade us to adopt new ways of doing things or expressing ourselves. Trends, of course, can be almost anything and traverse pretty much every field of human society. They can exist in art, fashion, retail, architecture, science, technology, politics, philosophy, our value system, and more. People can trend, as we all know, too. <laughs> Um, as we've all experienced, sometimes small insular trends eventually result in dynamic paradigm shifting changes across a range of contemporary life sectors, from again, technology and art to even outcomes in the legislative, political, social, and moral realms. 
It's the job of the trend forecaster to find emerging trends, predict their arc of adoption or rejection over diverse segments of society, hypothesize why the trends have emerged and what it says about our larger world and the larger thrust of history that they have emerged here and now. In my mind, it's sort of a form of cultural excavation that's not dissimilar to what many creative people do on a daily basis um, anyway, but you know, perhaps in less formalized um, conscious ways. The controversial worlds of mimetic and evolutionary biology led by thinkers like Richard Dawkins, who I'm sure many of you have probably heard of, also provide us with another means of defining trends. As described by Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene, we can understand trends as memes or what we might call social viruses. Dawkins defines a meme as a cultural version of a gene, self-replicating in response to social, ethical, biological, or environmental changes that might influence its survival. According to Dawkins, memes can be anything, songs, catchphrases, ways of dress, social movements, etc. Basically anything a trend is, a meme is, because they're the same thing. Um, just as genes propagate themselves in the gene pool by migrating from one body to another via sperm or eggs, leading evolutionary theorists believe that memes, again, or trends, propagate themselves in the meme pool by passing from brain to brain via, via a process called imitation, whereby one person imitates a behavioral characteristic of another because of the advantages in doing so. Advantages like being more competitive, more beautiful, intellectual, or culturally or socially advantaged in some way. As scholar Susan Blackmore puts it, the best imitators would thereby acquire higher social status, further improving their survival chances and helping to propagate the genes that make them talented imitators. This is probably sounding very familiar to a lot of us as, you know, Darwinian theory, evolutionary biology 101. Of course, it's worth noting that, again, memes sit in the world of the theoretical and Darwinian theory belongs to the world of evolutionary biology and physical science. But that said, these principles for explaining the cultural spread of ideas are a widely accepted part of the discourse surrounding trends and trend theory. So, Let's think about how these dynamics manifest themselves a little bit more granularly. Granularly. <laughs> um, oh, I guess I never did that. <laughs> um, we may find ourselves buying a certain label, photograph ourselves in a particular environment or at certain angles, or maybe we may choose to not photograph ourselves online at all. We may choose to collect one artist over another, buy Danish furniture, patronize certain coffee shops over others, share memes on the internet. We may of course do these because we think that we like these things and maybe we do. But also because partaking in these phenomena has certain social, cultural or psychological values attached to it. We may do it for the gram or for more likes and followers. We may do it to demonstrate our taste or influence our social connectivity. Some of us of course do this consciously like bloggers, influencers, YouTubers, and other extremely online people. But for many of us, these are kind of unexamined unconscious decisions. We feel we're just going with the flow of our own tastes or are we? Sociologists would argue that we are not, that we are responding to subtle social, environmental, and psychological pressures from friends, family, the media, strangers, um, that push us to align with certain flows moving through culture. So to map a person's receptiveness to trends and to chart how trends move and evolve through society, in the early 60s, an American sociologist called Everett M. Rogers developed a theory called the diffusion of innovations. The diffusion of innovations is a theory that seeks to explain how, why, and at what rate new ideas and technology spread. 
Rogers argues that regardless of what innovation or trend emerges in a society, uh, the pattern of its diffusion through a particular group, community, or social tribe is always the same. It's a pretty wild notion if you think about it. What's also totally nuts is that even with the rise of social media and the speed at which we now communicate ideas, the same pattern apparently still holds true today. The diffusion of innovation theory divides a given society into five groups. The spread, of the spread of innovation in a society starts with an idea or with an innovator who has this idea. They in turn pass this idea on in its rawest, purest state to a group called the early adopters, who in turn transmit the idea in a more user-friendly way to another group called the early majority. The idea is then made more palatable again and passed along to the late majority who then socialize the idea or new technology in ways that make it even more compelling and less threatening to members of a larger, less innovative group called the laggards. So Rogers was uh, basing this theory upon research that he conducted that examined why farmers in Iowa um, back in the 60s were um, why some farmers were more innovative than others when it came to adopting new farming technologies like hybrid corn, um, which is not the most uh, sexy subject, of course. But we can still use the same process to describe how all new ideas are created, communicated, enriched, adopted, diffused, and finally dissipated throughout society. Another crazy rule that Raymond mentions, um, Mart Raymond is Martin Raymond, the author of this trend forecasting book, um, is that sociologists, trend forecasters, marketers, et cetera, have found that these five social groups, while loosely bound and more archetypal or ideal than actual, remain more or less the same size in percentage um, regardless of where the sample size is located and whether you're measuring an online or offline community. So let's take a closer look at these social archetypes, which in turn will tell us more about how ideas are spread. So innovators make up the smallest percentage of the population, about 2.5%, and are one of the most important groups for forecasters to focus on. Innovators are disruptors, uh, change activists, risk takers, and the authors of tomorrow. In themselves, they don't have to be creators, artists, or inventors, but they do have to be individuals who can simplify and hone an idea in such a way that it becomes compelling, sticky, or viral. Take, for example, uh, social media sites, which date back, you know, way, way back to the way back to the 90s. Um, it wasn't until much later um, in recent years that the, the innovative potential for better or worse of the idea of virtual social networks really took off. Um, and this is of course with the formation of apps like Facebook, Twitter, Uber, and so on and so on. This is to say that an idea may have been kicking around for a while, but it takes the right innovators to make it realize its full potential as a consequential and pervasive trend. So while innovators see the ideas of disruption, it's actually the early adopters who are crucial to spreading the word about innovators and their ideas. Uh, whoops. Um, Unlike innovators who tend to be more singularly focused and whose social networks are a little bit more insular, early adopters are very culturally promiscuous and tend toward wider cross-cultural and cross-media associations. These are people who have like voracious appetites for media, probably a lot of Geminis. Um, Early adopters tend to view new ideas as their most valuable social currency, and they're usually the folks writing for the periodicals, websites, and blogs that we turn to for fresh, outside-the-box takes on the world around us. At 13.5% of the population, they are the evangelizers, 
uh, the influencers whose curiosity, empathy, um, wide base of knowledge, uh, experience, and ability to network and connect different people together attract innovators, but which crucially also reassure and convince the early majority to adopt a new idea. These conversations and collaborations that are happening between innovators and the early adopters who sort of evangelize their ideas are a crucial part of the, um, of the spread of an idea because it's the early adopters that trigger what is called the critical mass when they adopt an innovation. And I'll just define that really quickly. Critical mass describes the point at which a trend becomes basically ubiquitous. It's so infectious that few people can resist it. If you've heard of or read uh, Malcolm Gladwell, you've probably heard him use critical mass's other name, which is the tipping point. All right, that was early adopters. The next group is uh, the early majority. Um, they're about 34% of any overall market sector or segment of the population. Although they aren't opinion leaders in their own right, they nonetheless know many opinion leaders in the early adopter group and act as a bridge of reassurance to the late majority, which is the next group. Um, and the late majority tends to be a bit more skeptical of emerging trends and new ideas. So they need a little bit more reassurance before they buy into an idea. Um, the early majority consumes media that they trust. They follow experts with sterling reputations and they buy into new ideas and brands only when they have a proven track record and are widely endorsed by their peers. They wanna be one of many who um, prescribe to an idea, unlike the early adopters who their motivation is more about being the first to um, endorse an idea. Um, forecasters tend to monitor ideas that have been picked up by the early majority members of the population because, or at least um, when they're aiming to determine how popular the ideas will be with the late majority group. Because early adopters and early um, majority folks make up together 68% of the population, most big market researchers will focus their efforts on studying these groups because this is where the highest evidence will exist that something has gone viral and it's where the largest market share of potential consumers lies. But for other forecasters, these groups are less relevant for predicting trends. Um, but they are also still great data points for making conclusions about how an idea or innovation has been modified and morphed as it enters its stage of critical mass. So next we have the late majority. The late majority are those who are conservative by nature and require very high levels of reassurance and explanation about how a new idea will work and how they can benefit from using it or buying into it. They're 34% of, of any population, so they have considerable influence if your objective is for an idea to gain wide approval. They tend to adopt ideas in more watered down formats and only after seeing the idea very widely endorsed by um, early majority folks like celebrity bloggers, reality show winners, influencers on social media and so on. They are referred to as the greatest imitators of all of the archetypes and are governed by the social expectations and norms that they create with their friends and neighbors, as well as the norms dictated by the market and the culture more broadly. Because of this, they can be pretty fickle consumers of trends and ideas. They seek to fit in and they're the quickest to drop a trend or to cancel a company or popular figure. Lastly, we have the laggards who are the slowest to adopt new ideas and make up 16% of any given population. Laggards tend to err more conservative and they take the path of most resistance when it comes to trying something new. They are attracted to ideas that are traditional, familiar, and long tested. They are reluctant to change, suspicious of the new, and wary of difference and disruption. 
However, once everyone has settled into a new trend or idea, whether it's gender neutral pronouns or gay marriage or genetically modified food or climate change, so on, laggards tend to come around and will tacitly su subscribe to the idea, albeit in a more watered down format. And eventually it's the laggards as sort of the end stage of um, the trend cycle um, who become the baseline against which the next set of radical ideas are judged. So to sum this up, we can shorthand the passage of an idea through these five archetypes in the following way. We have the innovators where research and development happens and the idea first appears. We have early adopters where the idea goes viral, um, where it, the idea is introduced to the larger population and it is promoted for the first time. With the early majoritarians, the idea grows and is adaptive and enters the mainstream. In the late majority, the idea reaches maturation and saturation or reaches its peak. And then with the laggard, the idea declines and flatlines um, and dies out eventually. We can also predict the life cycle of a trend, its birth, life, and death as a graph. On the x-axis, we have the time it takes for a particular group to adopt an idea. And on the y-axis, the rate at which something is adopted. We can roughly place where and when this buy-in will occur across different groups in our population sample too, based on how we know each group to typically behave with ideas first occurring among innovators and ending up over time with the laggards. This is known as the diffusion of innovation curve. Um, the, the, excuse me, the time of this diffusion, of course, is subject to tremendous variability and is dependent on many factors. Um, technology, internet access, use of social media, your income, education, location, gender, race, levels of uh, sociability, connectivity, mobility so many other factors. But there are also two other qualities that I'd like to go into in, with a little more depth that uh, greatly determine the rate of an idea's diffusion. They are homophily and heterophily. Homophily is a word that denotes the bonds, similarities, and social activities that tie groups of people together in a, in a way that makes them similar in terms of how they think, look, act and engage with other people. It is, in other words, a desire to be similar to others. Homophil homophilous folks tend to have smaller networks and fewer social, intellectual, and philosophical encounters that are different and challenging. These are people who are, uh, have a, like a limited group of friends that they converse with regularly and tend to be confined to um, safe spaces of their own design or not. Um, homophily is most common among groups like the late majority and the laggards, but we can also see proof of pretty much all of our um, homophilous nature, I guess, in our use of social networks. You know, despite our potential for a truly global reach, um, the social connection, social media connections with whom we converse daily tend to live close to us and share similar ideas to us. Indeed, we often refer to this edited view of the world within which many of us live as a filter bubble. Since forecasters rely upon contact with a wide range of perspectives and identities in order to do their work, a homophilous forecaster would be in a huge bind on a day-to-day -day basis, unless they made a concerted effort, their interactions online and otherwise would tend to be echo chambers of similarity and agreement. To endow themselves with the best chance of observing culture in its whole complicated heterogeneous form, forecasters aim to be the opposite of homophilus, which is heterophilus or loving of difference. Heterophilous people tend to be more open, keener on change, and have larger and more ethnically and socially diverse networks. 
Because of this, they encounter new ideas and attitudes and memes or idea viruses more frequently than their homophilus, homophilus counterparts. Consequently, they are more likely to embrace and disseminate and dispense with the ideas or experiences in a shorter or a shorter and more concentrated period. So in other words, they pick up ideas and let go of ideas at a faster rate than homophilus folks. The more heter heterophilus people you find in a group, the more likelihood there is that this group will be an early adopter or innovator group. They seek out connections and experiences that take them outside of their social, cultural, and political comfort zones. And they are happy to have biases challenged and their reach the world extended. In order to do their job well, a forecaster must be heterophilus at their core. All right, so we've touched on some qualities that you may need to cultivate in order to be a thoughtful interpreter of the world, regardless of whether you're creating a trend report for a major company or um, just trying to gather um, some data on the world around you to inform an artwork or a curatorial endeavor, whatever. Um, so now we'll discuss a couple more qualities that the trend forecaster must possess to do their job well, but we'll also explore how the job of for, of job uh, how the job of forecasting is done. So much of a forecaster's time is spent trying to identify new patterns, weak signals, anomalies, and disruptions in the culture at their nascent stages. They do this by observing the activities of groups like the innovators or early adopters, and they do so in the cities, tech parks, virtual platforms, and social media enclaves where these people are found. At the beginning of the search for emerging ideas and trends, forecasters are required to be at their most vigilant and aware because they, are, they may not even know what they're looking for yet. Futurists call this search for new patterns many names, including scanning, mapping, intuiting, spotting, hence trend spotting, or brailing or cultural brailing. So if we're forecasters, we are looking for anomalous change, uh, shifts in the social, technological, ethical, environmental, or political landscape that indicate difference um, herald newness or alert us to the fact that something in the status quo is amiss. We're identifying points of tension or in some cases as forecaster Henry Mason says, we're looking for the newness between what people want and what is currently available. Another name for these nascent signs is weak signals, bits of ran randomness across many sectors of society. Again, arts, technology, office culture, consumer habits, could be anything, that begin to hint at a larger narrative or a bigger purpose. Um, let's see. So when we're doing this scanning, we're, we, may, we might start with a random list of objects, products, and behaviors from industries with little in common. And as we're gathering data, we may start to observe a larger meta-narrative materialize. We then might ask, is this a happy coincidence? Is this an accident? But the good thing about trend forecasting is that um, its methodologies allow us to divine if there are underlying logics and shifts um, that ex um, in culture that explain um, why certain ideas are popping up in different forms across different industries or sectors of society. Um, so the trend forecasters methodologies, in other words, um, helps us to detect shifts in the shifts that culture regularly undergoes, and it helps us to unmask the roots of our own biases, tastes, and behaviors. So the first step in spotting, defining, and predicting trends is to scan the culture, as we just discussed. 
And as we look for the seeds of tomorrow's big ideas and hypothesize which ones will eventually see uh, widespread adoption, we might have several questions percolating in the back of our heads. Um, are the weak signals we're looking at, uh, or just skipping that, are the weak signals we're looking at new, innovating, and game-changing? Have they shifted from being an innovation to something early adopters have started championing, championing and chatting about? Do they suggest a wider, deeper shift in the culture? Is this happening across a diverse array of sectors? Do they have mimetic qualities, i.e. are they simple, easy to replicate, explain, visualize, and compelling in terms of how they will change the current status quo? Uh, what are the friction or inflection points that they may have to overcome before spreading more widely? Can these friction points easily be overcome? And do they have a broad social, political, or cultural appeal? We can make this process of scanning and self-interrogation a, a bit more organized, though, by breaking the process down into five simple questions. Who started the idea? What is the idea called? Where did it come from? Why is it emerging now? And when was it first noticed? In other words, the who, what, where, why, and when of an idea. The who of a trend is often the first questions for the first question that forecasters seek to uncover. Without the who, um, who is usually an innovator or a group of innovators, it's difficult to determine the importance or cultural relevance of the what and whether or not the idea is likely to cascade into a trend. The next question is the what, the nature of the trend, innovation, or cultural shift being identified and codified. While the innovation itself can be an object, idea, or conceptual shift, the what is really about how you contextualize this shift in a way that consolidates its presence and gives it value, meaning, context, and legitimacy. For example, um, as cringeworthy as it may be, a what could be a trend like leisure, which is a portmanteau of business and leisure, which describes the trend of work, workspaces that look and feel like private clubs and the intermingling of vacations and businesses, or vacations and business, as well as the winnowing line between work and play more broadly. So once these first two questions are answered, the where comes into focus. The where can be virtual, real, or fictional, and it's where innovators and early adopters congregate and converse, which is typically and rather impre imprecisely defined as the margins. The margins tend to be where startups are, where we find artist studios, but they can also be subreddits and um, private Instagram accounts, a cool coffee shop, a club, or even whole neighborhoods and cities where a large number of what large numbers of hetero, heterophilus and creative people gather. But in surveilling the margins of society, culture, thought, technology, and so on, we come to one of the most difficult, but to me, most interesting questions. Why? Why is this idea emerging here? Why now? Why this person, this place, this thing? Invariably, answering this question involves looking at the trend as it manifests itself in the greater culture, whether it's the rise of mindfulness, um, artisanal wines, or clean and cruelty-free beauty products, as a couple of examples. And then working back from the trend itself to the underlying drivers or causes within a society that may have pushed us along this path or way of thinking. Lastly, the when of a trend happens when certain social, cultural, technological, and creative forces are aligned in ways that favor bursts of disruption. When we're searching for the when, we're very much caught up in the answers of the other questions, as we're looking to detect the forces that have encouraged the innovation. These forces can include everything from the racial, sexual, and cultural mix of a community to the prevalence of, say, uh, 
cutting edge university or lab, our uh, cheap rents, um, high speed internet, a young creative population, a bunch of other examples I won't get into. Um, in other words, a community with a lot of heterophilous engagement. Um, for a great example of a, how a when factored into a major innovation, we can turn to the proliferation of one of our uh, favorite beverages and one of my personal favorite uh, pre-COVID destinations, coffee in the coffee shop. Um, Raymond talks about how when uh, coffee first became really popular in, um, in England, um, it coincided with the development of um, the first coffee houses, which then in turn became sort of informal salons and meeting places for people of all walks of life to mix and mingle. And he credits this in part with, you know, the development of enlightenment ideals, um, explosions in technological development, so on and so forth. Of course, there were a lot of other factors that were um, at play in um, that particularly like disruptive moment in our history. But um, I think he makes a good point that, that, that uh, these communal gathering spaces, along with the stimulation of caffeine, um, probably did play a role in, in those movements. So um, at this point in the book, Raymond creates this really nice extended uh, sort of step-by-step -step example of a sample forecaster following a hunch through the whole process of developing it into a supportable hypothesis. Um, my impression from uh, Raymond's accounting is that there are a wide variety of approaches to this part of the process among trend forecasters. And there's also a lot of variety depending on um, your end goal, of course. Um, but since we're short on time, um, I'm going to give you, I'm going to take you through a slightly abridged version of his example um, and sort of take us through a sample working process from naming your hunch to penning a final trend report. Before we even settle in on the hunch we're going to explore, let's imagine that we're already practicing um, amazing trend forecasting hygiene. This is a term I made up. Um, so good trend forecasting hygiene uh, would be, um, we would be extremely culturally promiscuous. We would be subscribing to a huge number of blogs, magazines, YouTube channels, and so on. We're following a ton of different kinds of people on social media. We're attending conferences, festivals, and other gatherings constitu constitutive of many disciplines and many communities. To make our forecasts richer, we're also following important and emerging voices across many disciplines. And we're regularly seeking out and cultivating networks of experts, innovators, and early adopter consumers who can, who can help us see, hear, smell, taste, and touch the future. So that's sort of our ideal baseline. Um, so let's say that we've settled in on a hunch. We have an idea that we're noticing this idea pop up in a bunch of different sectors and we wanna explore that more and see, trying to find if there's a logic behind it. Um, maybe we wanna make some predictions about um, how this idea will shape certain sectors in the future. Um, so we are, our first step is to just scan culture all over the place. Um, we're letting our five W questions, who, what, when, where, why, uh, percolate in the back of our minds. And we're clipping articles, we're collecting color swatches, we're transcribing lectures, collecting uh, detritus from clubs and conferences, we're scribbling notes, sketching, taking photos. We're probably filling our entire computer uh, memory with screenshots. 
Um, we're also reading a ton from a wide range of sources and talking to key innovator and early adopter contacts that we've cultivated across many industries, disciplines, and backgrounds. Our objective at this point is to catalog in a very free form way all the weak signals that we've encountered that relate to this hunch that we've been nursing. We're also getting out and hitting the pavement. We're engaging with people in live environments and we're observing all matter of phenomena from the way a shirt is styled to the typeface on a concert flyer to the prevalence of a certain condiment among several new restaurants. Um, of course, the scanning process requires us to be highly self-reflexive in order to be successful. Name your hunch, scanning, bias trap. We have to be alert to any biases that may impact our overall judgment, as well as blind spots we've cultivated over our lifetimes. Bias types to be particularly wary of include expectancy bias and confirmation bias, wherein expecting to find evidence of a particular theory or result, you end up misinterpreting the weak signals you've been gathering in order to satisfy your initial thesis. There's also herd bias, also known as groupthink, where we conform to the, to the preferential biases of the social groups we live within. And then of course, there are the countless other biases related to any number, number of identitarian concerns and so on. So let's say we're keeping our biases in check and we've gathered a ton of data and we're ready to start focusing in a bit. What do we do with all this raw, unwieldy, unbridled information. Oftentimes forecasters will create what's known as an evidence wall or a mapping wall, a big surface where all of these materials can be hung and arranged together into one chaotic hole. The result is kind of like a giant pin board or Pinterest board. In this way, forecasters are able to start shaping a picture of how these weak signals intersect with one another which can then propel more scanning and collecting. But perhaps in the next round of scanning and collecting, you're doing it with a bit more focused, uh, more focus, um, which would be based upon the specific questions and ideas that have arisen um, in response to the previous round of research and the connections that you're making, you're starting to make on your uh, evidence wall. So basically that process of uh, scanning, collecting, painting to the wall, doing a little bit of synthesis, that repeats you know, as many times as um, you feel inclined to. Um, so as we're scanning and research, researching, we'll also want to determine the scope of our trend, that is its reach across industries, and cultural, technological, and political spheres. To do so, we can try this test called the three times rule or trend clustering, which is not a scientific rule, but is widely used among forecasters. Basically, the test involves identifying at least three examples of the idea or product um, that you're researching um, within the same industry or sector, and then seeing if that same idea also occurs across three or more sectors that are not directly related to the sector that you're examining. The aim, again, is to see how, pe how pervasive the spread of an idea is, which will help us to determine how large of a shift is occurring among people's wants and needs. So, some industries and cultural disciplines naturally go together. Take fashion, beauty, and accessories, for example, or uh, food and drink and hospitality. We might see if and how our idea manifests in either of those two clusters. But then we'll want to create a new cluster made of industries that have no obvious connections. So, for example, let's say that we're examining the trends of sustainability, authenticity, and traceability. We could find their presence in the cluster of food, drink, and hospitality quite easily. So that's a cluster of like sectors. But we could also find examples across diverging industries, like automotives, 
in the case of zero emission, electric and hybrid cars, uh, fashion, um, brands like Reformation, um, uh, consignment resale sites like The Real Real, um, and retail more generally. Um, you could use Tom's as an example, um, any number of uh, sustainable um, coffee growers, um, Everlane, so on and so forth. So in the case of the trend of sustainability, authenticity, and traceability, because it occurs across many sectors that tells us that these are trends that are likely to have a lot of staying power and to be pervasive for a long time. So eventually we find ourselves ready to compose the trend thesis, which if your end goal is to pitch to a company or forecasting agency, it's usually a two page document that roughly outlines the five W's that you've been seeking to answer in your research. In itself, the thesis isn't necessarily proof that the trend exists, but it's more like um, a skeleton of a trend that needs to be further validated and explored. So at this point, um, a lot of professional forecasters will bring in a panel of experts um, to help challenge and validate the thesis. There's a whole chapter of the book dedicated to how to select an optimum panel. So I won't get too deep into it because we don't have time, but common sense and um, you know, kind of applies here. You're gonna be looking for a diversity in your expert panel across every metric. And you're gonna go, you're going, you're gonna be going for uh, thought leaders and experts across many disciplines who have knowledge far beyond uh, your own area of expertise. You're also gonna want people who are one step removed from the day-to-day -day workings of the trend because you want people who can address the issues you've raised kind of laterally and obliquely so that they can give you kind of unexpected takes on your findings. So with this panel, we validate, contextualize, connect, and further illuminate key points uncovered during our research. And then with this expert panel's feedback, we can then incorporate meaty, heady stuff like existing research, reports, surveys, and academic papers into the thesis itself. Monitoring other trend forecasting agencies is also a great idea to see if our buzzwords and concepts are showing up on other people's radars. Raymond also suggests supplementing this refinement process with interviews with fellow forecasters, uh, consumers, experts, and a range of folks from all parts of the diffusion of innovations curve. After all of this data is collected, Raymond instruct us, instructs us to print it all out and to add it to the wall. We're literally going back to the drawing board. Um, but at this point, we're gonna be, we, we're gonna put a pause on our um, scanning and gathering and we're gonna just focus right on the wall. So scanning the wall, certain visual and textual patterns will inevitably emerge. Key themes that suggest that there's a bigger story here. This part of the process and the role of intuition more broadly is actually pretty fascinating. And it actually um, has an entire chapter devoted to it um, in uh, Raymond's book. So if you're interested in learning more, it's chapter three by the book. Um, so we're scanning the wall back and forth and we're slowly removing that which doesn't feel like it fits with the other materials or the central idea forming in our heads. We eventually get a less cluttered wall, but it still needs refinement, a refinement to be legible and logical. We can then synthesize this data into any number of, manageable, of, of more manageable formats that forecasters have developed. Um, one format is the trend cartogram, which organizes and diagrams the five W's that we've been talking about. Um, it answers the who in identifying the innovators of the trend. It answers the what in naming the trend. It answers the where in assessing the current impact of the trend within society. And it answers why. Um, by revealing the drivers or influences under 
underpinning it across key sectors. Um, and then we've got the when. Um, so it so it answers the it, it proposes um, what the consequences of this of this idea uh, may be in the short and long term based on the experts findings and your findings. And lastly, it identifies and articulates what these changes will mean to the society and culture we live in over the long term. So once these questions are answered, the cartogram is complete. And that trend you had a hunch about is now visualized and explained in a way that makes it transparent both to other people and hopefully to yourself. All right, so um, that is our primer on trend forecasting. I hope that this introduction has been helpful to you and that um, it's been clear how any part of this process can be hijacked, reconfigured, broken apart, and so on, um, and made to have a wide range of uses beyond crafting a forecast for a business or, predict or predicting the success of a product in the market. Um, this presentation has basically been almost, <laughs> like, almost line by line the first two chapters of um, the book, the Trend Forecaster's Handbook. Um, and so if this information has been um, interesting to you um, and you'd like to investigate more, I highly suggest uh, emailing Emma at the Atlantic Contemporary and grabbing a copy. Um, let's see. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say. Um, just to give you guys kind of like a sneak peek, uh, sneak sneak peek, a sneak peek into the rest of the book. Um, like I mentioned, the next chapter, um, chapter three goes into um, the role that intuition plays in the forecasting process, and it demonstrates different techniques for kind of developing and improving your intuitive facility facilities and faculties, which is like pretty cool. Um, the next chapter is devoted to uh, cultivating optimum networks for greater forecasting accuracy and success. Um, and then later chapters dive into phenomena such as cultural triangulation and scenario planning before closing with a chapter more specifically tailored to the relationship between uh, foresight and design development and innovation. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing the screen, I think. Um, and yeah, so we can um, can open up into our workshop discussion section. Um, for those of you that want to participate, you're welcome to unmute, put your videos back on, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Oh, I'm gonna take a drink of water. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That was fantastic. Yeah. Oh, also, does anybody have any questions about the presentation before we dive in? You can type. Um, I'll, ask, I'll ask one. Okay. Um. So, you know, a lot of ways, and you. Um, relatable to and is useful in like a marketing um, in a marketing sense and mm -hmm. to typically for like you know product development and that kind of thing so I'm curious from your research how you feel like um, it can be translated into like into the art world into you know in curating even it feels like at this point in time like curating is like a trend forecaster <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, I, I think that um, for any profession where your task is in some way um, having to do with um, synthesizing the culture around you, offering original analysis of the culture around you, um, expressing culture and, and and when I say culture I, I'm, I'm just using that as a catch-all term for all aspects of human and non-human life really um 
you know, this is the job of, you know, I think that these, these, techniques are really they're they're like research techniques really and they give us tools to for kind of deciphering um what our current moment is about what past moments have been about what the future holds um and yeah i mean i think i think all art and all curating all creative endeavors are reflections of their time um whether that's an explicit goal or not, it's just like a baseline. So to equip yourself with um, tools to kind of really like deepen your engagement with the world um, and to kind of like deepen your position, your take, your expression of that world, I think is is just incredibly, um, is, is an incredibly valuable uh, skill set, And it's that, um, supposition that led to my own interest um, in the discipline and my desire to share it with the Atlantic contemporary community. I guess with that said, um, and you know, as both of us as artists um, in our own way, um, besides programming, um, do you feel pressure to pick up on trends in like your way of making work? Um, for me personally, I, you know, in film and video, like I definitely am, I feel like I'm attuned to what is happening in with the medium. So I'm curious. <sighs> anyone else out there who's an artist or researcher or whatever? Yeah, like if, um, yeah, if people wanna jump in, feel free to unmute, reveal, what what's the what's the um admin revealed? <laughs> okay, that's um, staff in the other room. <laughs> no, well, I actually want to jump in only because um so I am um a user experience designer and researcher, and so my job is essentially identifying trends in what are like what customers and users are looking for when it comes to not only, um, it's really focusing on user needs, right? And so, um, and then the art part of that job is, I really resonated with this presentation because um, it was super refreshing for me because I, I'm, I'm like four years into my job at this point and like this allowed me to take a step back and remember like the foundational bones of what I'm, of like best practice in user experience design. And so, um, where the, like the secret sauce of, um, research when it comes to like technology and design, like, uh, app design comes in is like hearing user needs and then translating them in a visual sense. And so, um, there's a lot of like conceptual exploration that really gets into, as you were talking about, like the why, and then why this, why are we hearing? So I'm just going to use the example of, um, with remote work right now. So I work for a company, like a, a company that sells an enterprise product. And so, um, with remote work happening right now, we're seeing a huge change in behavior. And as a result, a huge change in what our customers are needing. And so as a result, like that my it's my team's job to translate like to decipher and base it we are like creating a whole wall of like we're hearing it here and here and here from like these different kinds of people and as you were talking about like um it's really important to to hear from a diverse pool of perspectives and then distilling it and synthesizing it down and then creating a story of um this is what people are looking for and then the art is like translating what that means in a visual sense. Sure. And so like, what kind of interaction does that look like? What kind of like end to end process from a design perspective does that look like? Um, so I really resonated with this and it's so timely because there's um, because of what's going on globally right now. I do think that we're seeing a, yes, it's scary, but it's also like a very fruitful time for um shifts in trends based on the cultural phenomenon, like the cultural needs that are shifting. And so I think um, 
without wanting, without be like coming across as insensitive to the like scariness and realness of the COVID situation, there's also the underbelly of like this is a very fruitful time for trends shifting based on changing needs. Yeah. So, for yeah, sure. I feel like I even oh go ahead. Go ahead. Just Joy. to add real quick that I feel like with that said, like the trends can literally change like day by day. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um I guess it's something I didn't say, but I, I, I hope was like kind of um, a given in the presentation is, you know, the, one of the interesting aspects of, and I'm sure this is part of your work, Steph, as a user experience designer and Veronica as a um, arts administrator, you know, paying attention to audience engagement stuff. I think we can all relate to this is we, it's part of it is sifting through information and learning and being and learning how to tell what is like what is just kind of a blip and what is actually going to have like what's actually going to be a constant lead to a consequential change um i think steph you also really outline i think you you demonstrated um an interesting answer while you are not um your, your day job is not in art, I think it actually gives an interesting answer to Joey's first question about, you know, why should artists be interested in this? Um, there is, you know, this sort of Darwinian, I, I see it as an advantage to um, be plugged in to, and like pay attention to trends, which I guess was your second question, Joey, because not only is there like the there, I think it can lead to economic benefit because you understand what the market is and, you know, how much an artist, res, you know, changes their work in response to the market is like a whole other question um, that, you know, I don't think there's any real consensus on that, or, you know, if, if that calls your integrity into question or whatever. But certainly, um, I think it makes for more critical and critically aware work because you because it it can give you the power to I'll stop talking in a second but I'm just going to say this one thing for me personally and I don't know if like other people on the in the chat can relate one of my favorite things when I'm encountering a piece of culture or you know somebody else's work is it's like the most electrifying moment when they're able to articulate something that I've never been able to articulate or had just been an unconscious hunch. It feels like magic to me. Um, and I think that, that that ability for me, and I think for a lot of other people really sets, you know, certain creators apart from others. It, it's the difference between a really cutting edge um gallery show and one that feels like oh you know I've kind of seen this you know so I think there is definitely something to be said you know as a budding art historian and Veronica can relate to this you know there's something to be said of course for um endeavors that focus on interpreting the past and uplifting the past and bringing that to the fore um but there is also you know, value in, though we shouldn't put too much value in, like, new, now, next, um, all of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm having, like, a strange kind of to, to pull off of something that Steph said, right? Like, what are, we're in this new normal, what is the new new going to look like, right? And, uh, you know, on a personal level, obviously COVID-19 is unprecedented and, and impacting people in ways that we can't even imagine. But on a, like, on a daily routine for me, I've been, I've started a yoga practice and I don't have to drive 45 minutes to an hour to get to work and 45 minutes to an hour to get back. And it's like, how, how can I personally find a way to maintain kind of a, a change in my routine once we go back to whatever the new new is going to be 
But at the same time, you know, on a professional level and relative to Atlanta Contemporary, you know, we're, we're trying to understand what does engagement look like now, right, in this virtual realm. But then also, what are, what are our people and patrons and members going to need when we are able to be back public facing, right? And, it, and yeah. it's not necessarily a, a want, but a need, right? And how, how can we serve that? And how can we understand that? And so we're, we're in this kind of same state of gathering information. I mean, we're sending out member surveys and surveys to, to kind of better understand our, our people. But, um, and you know, we're like, I'm meeting regularly with art museum directors and kind of hearing what they're dealing with. I mean, it, it is right now we're, we're in this trend forecasting moment because uh, I don't think any of us know one, when we're all going to be able to be back together and two, what that's going to even look like and, and how it's going to have changed, how the, obviously the economy is going to have changed, how the ecological world has changed and will be changing. And so, yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's almost it's, like we, we know we're doing, we're, we, we, we know we don't know anything right now. Right. And it's, and it's such a, it's such an amazing, um, just kind of like, outrageous example of this sort of like Darwinian social theory in a way where the people, but in this case, the trait is the trait, the, the capacity for foresight. So many of our jobs and our lives are sort of on pause. And so the people I would imagine, I'm guessing that the people who can anticipate what the world post COVID is going to look like may have certain advantages, whether that's, you know, retaining audience, um, financial, of course, like financial uh, advantages, um, even like anticipating how um, our relationships with other people may have changed. You know, there may be social benefits. So yeah, it does, it does feel like a very, um, it feels like a relevant topic for this time of kind of compression and reflection and it, it huge, potentially huge change. Well, yeah. like even thinking of like the film industry again, um, or video and TV even, um, like those industries literally work on producing content that, you know, takes working with groups of people and things like that. So it's really crazy to think about like how drastically this moment has changed that because so many productions are halted, you know, big budget movies um, that were being in pro like being shot have stopped. And it's like an industry like that, like, I wonder what they're considering, like, obviously like in TV, like we've seen so many shows be like, doing kind of this thing, like from home, like that kind of situation. And I believe today the Lady Gaga is doing something on TV, um, but like a concert from your home, like that's so drastically different than what we're used to in terms of like entertainment and how we experience um, like sports, like all of these, you know, major, major, um, uh forms of entertainment like have drastically changed yeah i think yeah. the real the real question i have on my brain is um kind of like veronica was saying in the you know the case of you know healthy habits it's like what what stays and what goes and um how and what are the you know more or less permanent changes that result from this you know i like for example i could see um, theater attendance potentially going way up after this because people will truly understand it could really go either way um, you know people perhaps will really truly appreciate and understand the value of live in-person encounters or we continue to become more and more atomized and disconnected and um mediated by technology and we just sort of like 
accept that and it doesn't really feel like an issue for the majority of us so um yeah that's that's definitely like it, the entertainment factor is a really interesting one for predictions yeah i i just to jump in i i think what's really cool about the where this discussion is going is um is about this trend forecasting discussion has been about like how to um how to the process of discerning trends in art making and creative work but i think where this conversation is also going is how we consume creative work and um veronica and joey are talking about like these massive industries with you know art museums and um movie theaters and um movie production companies are trying to figure out they're doing their own trend forecasting of with the current trend like with the current trends that are happening how can we pivot um how um people consume art in all its different forms and i think that that's really interesting yeah i mean it's it's what's also interesting to me is that the general scale of paintings I, like contemporary painting at least among my peers has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller um in part out of economic necessity but well i guess it is all economic necessity but part of that is about like the cost of shipping and like the internationalization of the art world it's like you don't want to you want to be able to fit it in your carry-on <laughs> like when you have that exhibition in Leipzig or, you know, wherever the hell, um, or it'll be, you know, cheaper to ship. And it's like, oh God, like how much smaller can we go? Like now that we're, and you know, potentially entering like a cataclysmic, <laughs> you know, global depression, it's like even something it's, it kind of reminds me of like the coffee shop example where it feels like these two really radically disconnected things, but they, it's like a domino effect. I just, I wonder, I don't know. I'm curious about like what the median size of contemporary paintings are going to be after this. Well, I remember in one of our talks in the past, we were talking about um, digital painting and I've actually seen people starting to like explore that again more seriously. Um, people who were working more like um, analog before. Right. Wow. Or even just potentially introducing that idea like that, you know, this this can make sense for now. <laughs> Digital exhibitions. Right. Yeah, also. Which I've, I've heard too. mixed reviews on that. Yeah, you might know more on that. Oh, no, I, I was <laughs> just gonna say that, you know, the thing that we're also thinking about is uh, the value of all of this too, like the economic value of it, right? Like that, you know, we are a free institution, you know, in it at our core and we value free, but what is the value of free? And particularly with, with so many people doing kind of um, living room concerts or how do we monetize this after the fact? How do we educate people that this is not, that this is being done out of a, a necessity and, a, and an importance of, of creating community in this alternate realm? But then how do we, when we're back up and operating in the new new, how do we add value to it? And how do we maintain a, a sort of economy of scale too? So um yeah i mean that's something that you know that we're thinking about and considering and and what is the impact that this is going to have on on institutions or on organizations or on businesses or where we're going to lose some right and and it's because they're they're not able to generate the necessary contributed or earned revenue that they rely on to do this and so like how do those if those organizations or businesses close, do we lose them completely or can we find a way to collectively absorb some aspects into our own existing institutions? Like, is there a way that we can radically embrace things that are going away so that they are not lost? 
Um, sure, so yeah. that's that's something I'm thinking about. Yeah, it's almost like, and um, I I I think you know, as also an arts administrator, Brandon, I'd be so curious what you think too. Um, but it's almost like this crisis, you know, if we're like using, if we're talking about like the art world as our sector of focus right now and like art institutions, it's like <clears throat> they've kind of pushed institutions to be like way more nimble and more diffuse and decentralized. And I mean, the Atlanta Contemporary, I think already is like very accessible on you know, across different registers, but like even removing, you know, the fact that like the contemporary in some capacity can come to you um, is really interesting to me. And it almost feels like something that the world would have appreciated even before. I mean, I, I know that like there's, you know, been so many like online initiatives and platforms that institutions have developed before this, <clears throat> but um, I don't know, maybe in some ways it's like, it's been a good kick to kind of jumpstart um, what are like hopefully like democratic, um, more like boundary breaking, interesting initiatives and yeah we're also though and on many ways faced with the reality that some things that we're doing are inequitable because people don't have access to internet they don't have computers yeah, well, and things yeah. like that so we're trying you know for us institutionally trying to find a way to deliver digital content in in to people that might or, or that not might that don't have these sort of uh, tools of the internet and the computer and the phone and things like that. So we're almost in a sense, like we've created all this content and we're realizing that a, a large part of our audience that comes to Atlanta Contemporary because we're free, basically because we're free, right? Um, that we do produce free content and we're, we're in a way almost not free now because we, we have the boundary of the digital realm so we're we're trying to figure out how can we export our content now to those people too i think brandon you were going to say something um yeah i think um i think that a really interesting thing happened in art institutions and festivals and whatnot and the and like the period between 07 and 10 and like 12 11 12 where everyone was going if we need to be digital, we need to be online, we need to be accessible, we need to be all of these things, and we need to be everywhere all the time. And then somehow in the middle of the past decade, all of that started disappearing, and a lot of the conversation went back to, well, you can't really accurately produce an exhibition for web. So we need to refocus on the physical institution, draw more people in, um, and get people back in the physical space, um, which I think, you know, if we go back to, you know, the Laura Reykjavik conversation, kind of resupposed the physical space as this like moderate, um, when in reality, in a number of ways, it, it wasn't. And, you know, for me, conversely, I see that seeing some of these organizations having to really figure out, you know, to Veronica's point, like, what does it, like, how do we reach the most people while figuring out some way to stay equitable? Um, I think that, dig I, I think that a number of ways the web has been one of the greater equalizers that we did lose. Um, and people are now realizing that there is an immense value in that kind of, and, and at least trying to figure out programming um, outside of the four walls. Uh, and I think that this is a great time uh, in terms of that, because we do we have a lot more technology. Um, more people have mobile devices. And over time, I think 
those things will work more to balance um, and break through that divide, that digital divide, um, and also bring more people into institutions um, down down the line. Yeah, it's almost like um, it, it. It almost feels like maybe um, you know during the the period that you mentioned there. You know, despite the fact that was you know during the Great Recession. Um, you know, there wasn't like, there's, that doesn't even like compare with like the kick in the ass that is happening now. Like you literally can't open your doors. So you have to do this. Whereas before it was kind of optional. Um, so yeah, it, it, it could, I think, I think you're right that it could create, um, not only new models, but also, um, a strong case for digital models and like continuing them, you know, whenever this ends. Um, well, yeah, we were having, oh, sorry, Brandon. We were having an interesting conversation uh, yesterday with my team about, you know, I don't know if you all remember those hoarder shows, right? Where they would be like, keep, toss and donate, right? And so we're we're also thinking like, you know, it's, it's been 30 plus days since we've been closed. And so what is the content that we've done that's been successful? Um, what sort of things do we wanna keep? What sort of things do we wanna to toss? What sort of things do we wanna donate, so to speak? Or, um, and so, yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out like what's working, what, what's not working, how can we, I mean, we're getting better at Zoom, right? Which is hysterical, <laughs> um, <laughs> and right? <laughs> it's like, who knew that we were learning these sorts of things and, and um, and you know, so what do we, what do we, how do we go from here? Like, what sort of things do we maintain? And are people, people are consuming digital content. So when we're doing our exhibitions moving forward, like, what sort of digital content do we produce now to kind of support that moving forward? Yeah, it's it's like this. I mean. I, I think it's not like a, it's certainly not a foregone conclusion or it's, what am I trying to say? It's not a, it's not a guarantee that people, institutions, you know, cultural actors will use this time as the kind of crucible of self interrogation that it can be, but it certainly does have it's like an apple in the tree. It's like, there's that potential if you want it. Like, you can take this time and use it this way. Um, so that's encouraging to hear for sure. And I think that, you know, going, let's go, it's really weird because it's it, like, this is nothing like the Great Recession. Um, <laughs> but there was a ton of, there was, it was a unique, it was a more unique opportunity in a couple of, in like, in a couple of ways, um, one particularly being we all of these tools that we're using now and enjoying were pretty much brand new. Like we're 14 years into Twitter, we're 10 years into Instagram. Um, but now you're seeing it like those were kind of you know, if you think about the Industrial Revolution, those were like the crucibles that were felt that looked and dealt more like, you know, the tri like the triangle factory. Like these were just they were places where people thought we could do a lot, gain a lot of attention, get a lot of money, etc. But it comes with all of these like really dangerous caveats. Um, and now we're kind we're we're in a much more humanist phase. Um, of this revolution where we're really trying to figure out well what do these tools mean for our privacy what they mean for uh, connection that's why I think like house party you know apps like house party are taking off a a an enterprise video tool like zoom is being used for social for like off for like out of office connection <laughs> um and we can take advantage of that opportunity and and part is a question for funders you know in the great recession nonprofits 
like art stores were receiving upwards of like a million dollars for like two for two to four years just to figure out what a digital strategy looks like without knowing with, we're in a time where no one knew what a digital strategy was uh but now that we've had you know a healthy two decades and a lot of concern about what is the human what is that human value um what is the human value of the work um and, and what is the and what is the monetary value of the of new work um and new media this could like you said this could be a really good space and i think that's something that we've been you know we've had this conversation a few times about figuring out well what does a modern if you started from zero what would a what would a new institution look like um and for organizations that are more nimble like a contemporary or a murmur or a mint um that question is going to be really easy to solve um the only real variable that's that we're having to play around with is timing um but i think for larger institutions that's going to be a very 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 hard question and we're already seeing it outside of this industry um you know we're seeing it with grocery i don't i think a long-term trend is that people will go back to smaller groceries um delivery and pickup you know i think some of us have like parents grandparents relatives that remember days where you got your you got your eggs and your milk delivered to you um and you got more things delivered to you than you having to go out and interact with uh then you having to go out and interact with a lot of people um and i think we're going to reconsider we're going to make a serious reconsideration of what scale looks like we don't need large um we could get away with you know like a bodega or like a double bodega size establishment um and it tells us what we really need. We don't need a lot of things we've contrived. <laughs> I yeah. think I think to your point too Brandon something that I I noticed and I was having a conversation with somebody the other day was that you know they they lost their job and they're starting at Kroger next week. Um and there was a a really kind of interesting moment where they were like perhaps earlier a job in that kind of environment seemed like like it wasn't for them and now they're so pleased to have this opportunity that i think there's a, a an interesting moment that's happening about again what do we need not what do we want of course you know we all would love to be you know doing the things that we would love to be doing but at the same time like if we have to pay our rent is is something like working at a more kind of traditional workplace like a like a Kroger or being a plumber or something that is more trade oriented is the stigma now removed more and i i i'm i'm sorry i'm yeah, rather inarticulate but yeah, that, I, I'm just thinking about that. No, I think it's. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say really quickly. I think maybe another way of saying it is like maybe the open question is um, as you know, more and more of us find ourselves out of work. Um, may is there some capacity, at least like within our like our cultural social views? to to like recognize the like the dignity of um like the dignity and value of um employment all jobs really employment, labor in general yeah labor yeah. in general i i feel like so there's this really brilliant um economist that i got to meet while at brown and i uh, think mark blythe and he did this interview right before, you know, not to get, not to pull politic, like political economics in too much. Um, he did this really interesting interview back in 2016 
um, where he was trying to explain while he was in Greece doing this interview, he was trying to explain why why people were willing to or why people were voting the way they were. Um, and he explains it really succinctly. He's, he goes like, look, here's the deal. For the past like 30, 40 years, we've all been taught that like you have a, there is like, there are respectively one or two trajectories to what we consider a good life. It was you do, you go to a liberal arts college, you do this thing, and then you get a job, but don't worry about it. Everybody's, the globalism is going to have you covered. Um, everyone's going to be a computer programmer. Um, or you're going to interact with a, com a computer in some way. Um, but then, you know, you tell that to the top, like, third to third to half of the population. And then you tell everybody else, you know, you're here to ensure that we have a service economy that ensures that these people have everything that they need, no matter what happens. And you are lucky and willing to be able to do that. Um, these people will go to their private schools. These people will go to their public schools, um, and this is how thing, This is this is what the strata is going to look like over the next century. Um, and repeatedly, we have found that economic theory and model, and even cultural trends, to not be true. And people finally started to realize that that's what's happened. And the Hamptons are no longer a defensible position. Um, and I find that. That's a very, you know, to your point, that's a very, it's a very interesting moment where people are beginning to, to both of y'all's points, uh, Veronica and Chris, that, you know, the strata of work was merely, you know, it was merely a perception when in reality that plumber does a lot more for me <laughs> uh, than I would do some, with someone else with an advertising and uh, philosophy background in uh, terms of like actually contributing to society and the economy I think in practical terms you know in times of crisis um, I think you know we need like there is a there is a place and a need for everybody um, but when you, but when we're in crises like this, where we really have to figure out what we, what do we take with us, and what do we hold on to, um, I am being constantly reminded of all of the other workers and the nonprofit um, and the arts spaces that are saying, you know, our conversations about the work that you put in weren't for not like there is a such there there are we do have measures to figure out like what work are we doing to contribute to each other as opposed to acquiring and hoarding more more wealth or more of like these loose standards for what it means for what it means to be successful mm -hmm. um, um that Tapping into like the people around you and the workers that are surrounding you and how do we tap into what we're doing for each other kind of reminds me of something I've been reading recently. Um, it's a lecture by um, Michel Foucault in the 70s and it's about genealogy. It's like the, the history of suffering and crisis and he calls it this genealogy as a sort of synthesis of erudite and popular knowledge. And he calls the method for researching these genealogies of suffering, it's you know the legacy that comes with you, what you're um, digging back up again. He thinks that the method for discovering this in local memories and popularly is akin to archeology. span And I was thinking, cause I used to study archeology span just for fun and there is a connection between archaeology and art, um, a term assemblage. Like when you go to a site, it's the assemblage of a cave, maybe all of the artifacts and objects that were found there. And so I was thinking about, you know, what mediums are going to be able to, in my mind, like my preference and opinions, accurately reflect or reify kind of my experience in this crisis. 
And I'm thinking a lot about duration. Y'all were talking about scale and I'm thinking, okay, what are the mediums or the um, experiences that will kind of put me into a sense of what the duration of this time of uncertainty is? Because even though we're in this present day, we don't know when this virtual tomorrow is that we talk about when this, you know, and we've said that already, but um, I'm thinking about genealogy, archeology, span and with this genealogy, it reminded me, like, I thought of that when y'all were talking about um, imitation and memes, because it's like this virus, it's alive and it gets inside of us. Now, you know, I'm just like kind of mapping the web of like what I've been thinking about and how it overlaps with what you kind of presented today. And you talked about divining, like to divine why certain shifts are occurring in culture and this forecasting thing. It makes me, and you were saying raw data earlier. I think a lot about like materialism and not just like on our plane, but astrologically, you know, people are like trying to divine and predict through astrology why these things are happening. And I um, have been getting back into looking at or studying scrying, which is a practice of metacognition where you look at a black surface or a black reflective surface and you allow um, forms, shapes, symbols to kind of come into your mental eye. And that practice allows you to have metacognition, which you take in and you listen to the information that's in your head, but you also discern what information is coming to you that's not your thought processing. And I think that is similar to the way that you explain trend forecasting. Yes. I was able to parallel that. Um, but going back to the genealogy, um, I I don't know. I guess I'm interested in this history of crisis because I, you know, I studied modernity in school and I like wrote about um, the Tiller girls. So when you were talking like, how do these ideas move? It also reminded me of um, that quote, like the ideas lying around that like here I can read it. It's thinking about what is um, around me that I can take in that is, sustainable like what part of the radio medium and anyway I'm thinking about the radio but there's this quote it's Milton Friedman I was about to say Milton Avery it's only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change when that crisis occurs the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around Mm -hmm. and I then went into the Foucault lecture and I was like, what are the ideas lying around within your local knowledge, my local knowledge? How can you reactivate them in opposition to the culture we will, as artists and cultural workers, increasingly be called upon to contradict? And that's kind of where I was going back into this history of crisis. And I was going back to like World War I, World War II, and then like in the 60s, 70s with this like, question of what is the postmodern and then after the fall of the wall kind of looking at all these sort of cultural like what the hell moments and most of the time the cultural workers that I like really identify with were bringing up this point that whatever new new that we're going into we have to be very humbly and consistently aware that we are the products of the old bringing out this new so it's like an integration but also a transformation and so I've been kind of seeing that visually like what does that look like as a process of evolution or development um, in my own self and kind of sitting with that and thinking about what this local knowledge is and then seeing just the mutual aid networks that are popping up and how those clusters and pods are interacting with each other, not, you know, so much physically, but collaborating virtually with the work. And we're like in my, I live in New Orleans and in my area, we're all like 
really rallying for better technology for organization that's not Facebook or Google, because we realize that our safety is like, you know, going to come up as an issue. Like if certain things are not um, taken care of properly. And I've recently been thinking more about, uh, you know, simulated reality as a way out, but you know, people are, talking about all that anyway so that's where I've been (laughs) cool um so what it's kind of so I'm seeing like certainly this connection between like the Michael Friedman quote about like um we reach for the ideas the habits you know our um the ways that we manifest culture and norms within ourselves in times of crisis and um like what what qualities are you like what ideas do you see kind of lying around you beyond Mm -hmm. um I guess the mutual aid societies would be one of them yeah um but like I guess um that was very interesting there's like so much to talk so much which is really awesome um but I guess the this is the first thing I'm thinking of is like um yeah it's like what what is that it's like this crisis is again I guess I've used this before it's like it is potentially like a real crucible because it forces us to reveal um not only like who we are like in a crisis of course but like which people would argue is our true nature but it's it's also um highly relevant and like interesting data, I guess, about, I guess, like you were saying about like, what are the ideas that we reach for? And we can figure out what those ideas are by looking at how people are behaving, you know? Like there's the, Mm -hmm. the, there's like the spring breakers in Florida who are in denial. There's the governor of Texas, you know, there's people screaming outside. I think it was like, the Ohio or Wisconsin legislature, um, you know, wanting the country to be reopened, but then there's mutual aid societies. And there was, I read that there was some study that formed a connection between your willingness to go under quarantine and your belief in climate change, that Mm -hmm. one actually had a relationship to the other. so yeah, I'm curious, I guess I opened this up to you, um, Gabriella, but also everybody else, you know, like, um, are there any I kind of like otherwise latent ideas that we weren't necessarily seeing expressed in culture that have revealed themselves to have been here all along because we've reached for them and manifested them? It's very vague. Behaviors specifically? Yeah, I guess, like, behaviors, um, yeah. ideas. Just real quick on time, um, Veronica, what are your thoughts on wrap-up? Do we... Yeah, I mean, I think it's almost two, so we can kind of continue on this and maybe um, maybe end it in, like, 15 minutes or so. Does that okay. sound good? So yeah, I mean, I... I mean, mind you, we could all sit here. I know we're just wanton for community and conversation. <laughs> My computer is plugged in. It is recorded. We're good. So, <laughs> okay. yeah, I think latent wise, because I went through a period of intense self-isolation about a year and a half ago, and that was kind of voluntary, kind of not voluntary. It was because of mental health. And so now going through this, my body's like, wait, we went through this. Is everything okay now? But when I was originally in that period of self-isolation, I was really thinking about denying publicity, like denying my appearance and not the control around that, but kind of the stories that it holds up inside, like by not, um, I made a post about it, but by... I say fugitivity could be another mode of storytelling. Like when someone runs away from visibility and makes themselves scarce, what does it say? What truths does it hold up? Refusal can be a sort of protest of all of these conditions of being. And I was thinking more about gender expression and 
now that we're all in our homes, we're all in our own dwellings, we're all basically an other to each other person, like when we're at home and we're not in relationship to each other, except, you know, when the people we might be living with or quarantined with, or even now, like what is the technology of the webcam that's separating me as a veil from you and like the plane that I see you in, in this frame? Like I'm thinking a lot about perspective, the gaze, being like denying publicity as a cure too, because before all of this, I was studying plagues and like the way that seriously, because I was really into Hugo Ball's um, obsession with exorcisms. And then I was reading Arto and he was talking about the plague and how it exhausts itself in a society like a possession of the spirit. And so I was looking at that and then this happened and I was reading about something called Choreomania or St. Vitus's Dance, which was considered to be a possession, like something that needed an exorcism, but it would happen where people would just start dancing in the streets and, you know, the dark ages. And if someone saw someone else dancing in the street, they would just start dancing. And the only way to cure this possession of the person of a suspected demon would be to deny publicity of those affected. And so I'm thinking about, you know, the denial of publicity and also its relationship to the state and like private life, because if our state or, you know, our nation, our nations had better organization where we could do mobile testing and such, it wouldn't, the cure wouldn't rest on individuals denying their own publicity or their own appearance into like relational society. Um, but that's something that I've been like returning to and so has this idea of duration. Mm. But behaviors lying around, I guess it would be just what's happening right now with people having to quarantine themselves and quarantine being a state, but also I feel like it's a behavior where you're self-isolating in a way. It's a, it's a choice because it's part of our relationship to each other is this desire to take care of ourselves and each other and that action in turn shows our relationships to each other even though we're not really having these direct one-on-one face-to-face kinds of experiences mm-hmm. also gorilla if you want to share any links on the chat you're welcome to okay um yeah i don't have a link to the lecture from foucault but it's um in a book, Art and Theory, from 1900 to 2000, if any of you know the series. Cool. I have it upstairs on my shelf. <laughs> it's, it's a great one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Something I mean, about I, duration, go ahead. Uh, just really quick about duration, it made me think about, um, you know, the previous talk we did was about, you know, focusing on like land art and um, kind of like why this resurgence in the topic. Um, and it made me kind of think about when you mentioned um, caves, I believe, you yeah. mentioned, or like archeology span um, and how, you know, at this moment, it seems like land art could potentially be interesting in terms of like outdoor exhibits or something that requires, you know, distance. Um, so I'm just, it's, and you know, t- coming back to this idea of ter- um, of like trends, like it's just a lot of that in my head right now. And how do we move forward in terms of like a proper exhibit? Um, and by proper meaning, like you know, curated, intentional, and like what's what's what the pieces are in relation to each other. Um, potentially outdoor exhibits. <laughs> I'd be here for it. <laughs> I think there's something really interesting that you're talking about with the land art and it's ephemerality where there's, so I think that I was talking to my therapist about like, why are people reacting so, groups of people are reacting so differently to this crisis. And um, she said that people are grieving their old like social communities and we no longer have that. And so people are in different stages of grief. And I think that someone said this, that in a a crisis, people 
um, really think about like what they take with them and what they leave behind. And I think that leads to a natural um, thread towards ephemerality and um, really the like putting things in perspective about what matters and how what we thought was our table stakes in our cultural norms are can actually go away in a moment. And so I do think that in that line of thinking, like the idea of land art, and I think about you know spiral jetty, or I think about um, um, other like ephemeral art pieces that the documentation of how they return to the earth and things like that, um, and how we experience that remotely or in person, but usually in isolation. I think that I think that we will see more of that. So that's kind of what was top of mind for me. Veronica, I didn't mean to cut you off earlier. Did you have anything else? Oh, no, 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 mm -mm. we're good. All right, um, and then just back to your um, archetypes that you mentioned, I feel like we're all kind of the innovators right now trying to figure out <laughs> what. <laughs> What's next? Yeah, it was it was very interesting to do that research and be like, try and figure out where, you know, I stood and where other you know people I knew like fit into those archetypes. And it's, um, you know, by nature as being archetypes, it's like it's it's interesting to see at certain points in my life, I've been more one thing than another or, or certain. Um, aspects of a person's life I think they can be more conservative and um more risk-taking and others um yeah it was pretty it was pretty funny to be like oh damn I'm not as cutting edge as I thought <laughs> lies <laughs> yeah <laughs> um we have a couple just a couple minutes left does anybody have any like last comments like uh, final final predictions they'd like to share for the world? Um, just, this was funny and I mean, not funny really, but um, oh, where'd he go? Well, it was about how memes were described as a social virus and um, just in terms of the literal virus, like is kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I like well, that Chris just absented himself from his own conversation. I would just say that I hope everybody's loved ones are well taken care of and safe right now. Yeah. Same. Thank you. Same. I hope same. the same for yours. Thank you. Um, yeah. I think that's it. <laughs> I, I think we're um I wrote that really silly paragraph for Burn Away. Um, I don't know. I feel like oh, there he is. <laughs> a lot of people. Oh, where's? Oh, welcome back. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I feel like we're in this very. A lot of people call it strange. Some folks call it interesting. What? Uh, um, but I think we're in a really, really like critical moment um, and not to devalue anyone that's gotten ill or died or passed away, but we're in a very, there's a lot of good that can come out of this. Um, and I feel like pe as people that work in, um, in creative spaces and in industries, um, there, is, there is a kind of responsibility um to try to figure out like to help others figure out routes out of this space that they're in um and to like help those that aren't that aren't doing well find some way forward um mm -hmm. yeah well was this paragraph or you wrote it for burnaway uh it was one of the, it was like the first dispatch Oh, okay. 
um, a couple of weeks ago. Like Jasmine pulled a bunch of people in. Um, and hopefully- Yeah, I think to your, hmm. to your point too, I think there's gonna be um, a reevaluation on education and on the importance of domestic spaces and you know how like I have friends who are you know married to their husbands right these are women married to men who have two children and they have full-time jobs and navigating that space where um like one in particular had to have kind of a, a rather come to Jesus moment with her husband where she reminded him that roles are not dictated by gender and that, you know, her job that she has that has value is echoed in his job that he has that has value while simultaneously trying to raise their two children and educate them, right? And so there is, I think, an importance that's going to be placed on understanding what kind of more traditionally gendered roles mean and how that relates to domestic spaces and how education will be evolved out of this. And so I, I think you have a, an interesting point there in, in thinking about, you know, what, what is this going to do to understanding and comprehension of, of the word role um, even. And so, you know, there's a lot of CEOs of companies that are now, working from home, watching their children <laughs> run riot. Um, and, and they're seeing their, their partners having to manage where, you know, like, like, for example, a friend of mine who doesn't work and whose husband does is now, he's now seeing what her real day to day looks like. And he's, he's actually apologized to her. Um, which was a fascinating moment Good. right? for, for yes. her, right? Yes. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think like there's, there's a lot that's going to come out of this, which is hopefully to your point, Brandon, without, you know, trivializing or, or, um, or misunderstanding the kind of loss that's happening, right. That there is also this kind of beautiful reckoning that I think could come out of this, that, um, that is based on compassion and understanding and, and empathy, right? But yeah. That's like my it, final. Well, to piggyback on that, like it was one of the most surreal things I'd ever seen. Uh, yesterday, I was like flipping through YouTube and the governor of New York, he went on for about five to like eight minutes about how much he did not realize he had been skipping out on his kids' lives by being governor. And to have someone that people are paying a lot of attention to, um, and particularly like a male identifying person, um, just go, I did not, like, a lot of this stuff doesn't matter. We're here to do one thing and we're here to figure out how do we, re how do I, how do we reconnect to, you know, our, like our, just our neighbors or people we even live with was amazing to see. So I, I, along with you, I, I really do hope that that's, that people do really come back into a sense of uh, empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy yeah. and like hopefully like collective responsibility as well. It seems like something so many of us in this country have lost over time. Um, yeah. I want to touch back on, you mentioned education and I work at the Louisiana Children's Museum here and I was not trained to be an educator. I got a degree in art history, but working at the Children's Museum, I am really, now that I do have more of a background in education, I'm thinking a lot about how this changes, not just the culture of childhood, but play, <laughs> like uh, concepts of what is safe play, because play is such a huge part of the learning process. And if kids are afraid of other people and kids, just because, they fear for their own health in a different way, in a more tangible way, because they have a 
big reference for it, you know, all this time where you can't do stuff because of the virus. Um, I'm thinking about what my job, I still work, I work remotely doing, making digital content now, but I am really thinking about how it changes the IRL play and learning moments and how that's going to change, you know, 30, 40 years, what these kids do with their experience. How they develop. Yeah. yeah. Interaction. Yeah. But I, I'm also thinking about that now so that when I am amongst the children of New Orleans, after this is all done, I'm in a primed place to really pick up on how their behaviors changed from before to after. Wow. So that's fascinating. Yeah. That's really smart of you. I think empathetic and smart and strategic. Mm, scary like go into your calendar 30 years from now and make it <laughs> like remember they were traumatized oh my <laughs> god Ooh, hallelujah yeah I yeah. think your point I think your point about New Orleans in particular is really interesting because another friend of mine was like a friend of mine was pointing out New Orleans has like now gone through a like quadruple whammy over the past 15 years from Katrina to the recession to Deepwater Horizon to this. Yeah. And that's <laughs> part of the reason why it's primed to be as hot as it is with the virus. Um, mm -hmm. It has so much to do with inequity in the distribution of wealth here and specifically access to healthcare and t kinds of jobs because we're a big tourist industry city, but y'all know the story. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. <sighs> All right, well, I think we're at time if we want to wrap up. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, Gabrielle, it was really nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. And Brandon, it's always great to see your face, of course. And to everybody else who came. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Yeah, we still have other people. Hi, everyone. Yeah, yeah. hi to everybody. Bye, Clyde. Bye, Clyde. <laughs> <Howdy. Yeah. laughs> so Thank you, uh, Chris thank you, and Joey. Um, yes. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Veronica, for hosting. Yeah, oh, thanks you bet. For yeah, we're we'll we'll do this oh. again. I, I I think that we're we're gonna be living in a virtual world for a little bit longer. Arts and culture spaces were the first to close and probably will be some of the last to reopen. So uh, we look forward to seeing, unfortunately, right, uh, temporarily closed, but uh, we look forward to seeing everyone. And uh, these are such thoughtful conversations and just leave me just inspired and, and engaged. And so thank you, Chris and Joey, for leading us in this incredible talk. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks for all. having us. Yeah. See you all right. Bye, everybody. I'm going to end the meeting. Be well, stay safe, and healthy.